Welcome to ACM SIGMOD Records series of interviews with distinguished members of the database community. I'm Marianne Winslet and today we are at Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. I have here with me Mike Stonebreaker, who is a professor and serial entrepreneur at MIT and before that for many years at Berkeley. Mike won the Turing Award for showing that the relational model for data was not just a pipe dream, but feasible and useful in the real world. Mike's PhD is from the University of Michigan. So Mike, welcome. Thank, thank you, Marianne. 35 years ago, you told a friend that winning the Turing Award would be your proudest moment. While hardly the only factor in your success, I think that being so ambitious would have made a huge difference from day one. What do you think? Well, I think that if you decide to become a, an assistant professor, you've got to be fanatically ambitious because other it's too hard otherwise and so if you're not just driven i think people who aren't people who aren't really driven fail and so i think every everyone i know is really driven to to achieve and and i think those who aren't go do other things okay so would that be specific to Berkeley, or you think for computer science professors in general? I think that if you're at any any name university, including you know Illinois is no exception that mm -hmm. that it's publish or perish, mm -hmm. and you know ah. the only way to get tenure is to really mm -hmm. be driven. Otherwise, but, it's just too hard. That's true, but publishing is not the same thing as having impact, and you've had a lot of, of impact. Um, are there other character traits that you see, like competitiveness, um, that in your students has um, been a, a big factor in the impact they've had in their careers? Uh, I, I guess my, my general feeling is that you you have got to, you've got to be really driven. Uh, furthermore, I think if you're not at, at at one of you know two or three dozen name universities, it's really hard to mm -hmm. really make a difference because mm -hmm. the graduate students you have aren't that good. Right. And right. So I think you've got to have good graduate students, or or it's very difficult to succeed. Mm -hmm. And and then I think. Personally, anyone who works for me has has to learn how to code, mm -hmm. even though I'm horrible at coding, because mm -hmm. because I make everybody actually do stuff mm -hmm. rather than just write theory. I, I think it's it's really in, in our field is really hard to have an impact mm -hmm. uh, just doing paper and pencil stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you couched your advice in terms of um, advice for professors. Would it be different for people in industry or at a research lab in industry? Uh, I think, I mean, this is going to sound pretty snotty, but I think, you know, if the, the biggest impacts, I think, have generally come from people at universities. Industrial research labs have have two general problems. The the first one is the best way to actually build prototypes is with a chief and some Indians, and that generally doesn't exist at, mm -hmm. at industrial research labs. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's a marvel that System R managed to put together mm -hmm. you know nearly a dozen chiefs and get get mm -hmm. something to work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's problem one. Problem two is, you know, if if you're at a university, you know, if you don't, or at a name university, if you don't bring in money, you can't get anything done. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you you have to be you you have to be entrepreneurial. You've got to be a salesman. You've got to raise money. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are characteristics you don't have to have. You know, at an industrial mm -hmm. research lab, mm -hmm. and so I think you know, the really aggressive people self-select themselves into into universities. Okay. Although there are there are some exceptions, mm -hmm. but I think by and large, 
the people who've made the biggest impact have been in universities. Okay. In one of my other uh, jobs as um, one of the editors-in-chief's chief of ACM Transactions on the Web, I go through the major conferences that are related anyway in any way to the web and look at the best paper prize winners. And it is amazing how many of those now come from industry. Yeah, I think, I think the key thing on the web is that essentially all the contributions involve big data. Mm -hmm. And the internet companies have all the data and they don't share it with, with academia. So I think it's very difficult to, to make significant contributions in web stuff without being at a web company. You know, I think in, you know, in hardware, in the web stuff, there are definitely areas where it's hard to make a contribution in academia. But in the infrastructure side of databases, you think it's still possible to have strong impact as an academic researcher. You don't have to go where the data is. Yes, because I think okay. the thing I find really interesting is that, I mean, if you look at if you look at the contributions that have come from the database companies, mm -hmm. they're few and far between. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, uh, I think one of the bigger problems is that companies do not want to. You know, they're happy to let the vendor look at their data, but they don't want to share it with anybody else, mm -hmm. and they don't want to. You know, they don't want to. I guess my favorite example is that uh, I was looking, f you know, at I was looking for data on crashes, database crashes. Mm -hmm. In other words, why mm -hmm. why do database systems crash? Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a very a, a very large whale mm -hmm. who was willing to share their logs of, of database crashes, mm -hmm. and that went down the tubes because, number one, the company didn't want it to get out how, how you know, how, how, how low their uptime was. Mm -hmm. And then the vendor didn't want it to get out, you know, how, mm -hmm. how, uh, you know, how much they crashed. So, so I think, you know, the trouble with, with operational data is it tends to put egg on somebody's face, and that makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. So how do you still manage to have an impact coming from the academic side? Uh, I think, you know, that the, the easiest way to have an impact is to do something interesting and then get venture capital backing to turn it into something real. Because I think it's impossible, you know, like Ingress actually really worked, Postgres really worked, mm -hmm. but every system I've built since then, then just barely limped because mm -hmm. it just got too difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, and so you get a prototype that just barely works and then you get VC money to mm -hmm. make it real. Mm -hmm. And then you go and compete in the marketplace against the elephants. Because mm -hmm. I think uh, it's hard. It's hard for me to. I mean, I think there's a fabulous book by Clayton Christensen called *The Innovator's Dilemma*. And so, basically, it says that if you're if you're selling the old technology, it's very difficult to morph to the new technology mm -hmm. without losing your customer base, mm -hmm. which makes the large database companies not very interested in new ideas because mm -hmm. they're they can they'll cannibalize their yeah. existing base. So so I think you know the it's if you want to make a difference, you either try and interest a database company in what you're doing, or you do a startup. Mm -hmm. And I think if you don't do one or the other, then I think your impact is limited. And I think you know everyone. Everyone I know is interested in starting a company. You know, I think you know to make a difference because I think 
to to get to get your ideas really into the world, that's the only way to do it. With the Turing Award already in hand, what else would you like to accomplish in your career? Uh, at this point, I'm 74 years old. Am I, sorry, I'm 73, mm -hmm. and I don't know of any 80-year-old researchers that are still viable. Mm -hmm. And so my objective is very simple to stay viable as long as I can and to hopefully realize when I've fallen off the wagon mm -hmm. and gracefully retire to the sidelines. Okay. So I, I'm just interested in staying, staying competitive. Okay, staying competitive. One of your colleagues says that Mike is notorious for only liking his own ideas, which is certainly justifiable because he is often right. Tell me about a time you changed your mind on a major technical matter. Oh, I think, you know, my, my biggest failure uh, was I was a huge fan of distributed databases in the 70s and the 80s and even in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And there's no commercial market for that stuff. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, there's a gigantic market for parallel database systems, which are distributed database systems with a different architecture. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that, that that was where the big market was. And so, uh, and so I just missed that completely. I mean, okay. you know, and, and I, I, I could have written Gamma, but I, you know, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so that, that was simply a major theme that I just missed completely. And it took me a very long time to realize that there really is no market for distributed database systems for all kinds of good reasons. You spent decades poo-pooing specialized data management tools such as object databases and vertical stores. Then in the 2000s, you started arguing that one size does not fit all. Why did you change your mind? Well, I think the, what happened is that in the 80s, there was only one market for databases. It was business data processing. Mm -hmm. And for that market, the relational model seems to work very well. Mm -hmm. And so after that, what happened was all of a sudden there were scientific databases. Uh, all of a sudden there were web logs. Uh, and you know, these days, everyone on the planet needs a database system. So I think the market has broadened incredibly mm -hmm. since the 80s. Mm -hmm. And I think in the, in the non-business data processing mm -hmm. piece of the market, Sometimes relational databases are a good idea, and sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. And I think that that realization, you know, what was market driven, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I didn't, you know, I changed my mind, but based on the market mm -hmm. being very different. Was there a particular moment that happened? Something you saw that you said we got to diversify? I don't think. You know, the, the question is, where, where do good ideas come from? Mm -hmm. And I have no idea. I mm. mean, they just seem to, they just seem to happen. Mm. And I think, you know, the, the way they happen is, or the way to make them happen best is to hang around smart people, talk to lots and lots of people, listen to what they think. And, and then I think slowly it, something sinks in and then something happens. So I think just for example, uh, before we wrote H-Store, mm -hmm. you know, I, a couple years previously, I had talked talk to a VC who said, why don't you propose a main memory database system for, for OLTP? And I said, because I don't have a good idea for how to do it. But it sort of generated the seed that somebody was interested in that topic. And so eventually we, you know, the ideas came and, and we built H-Store. So I don't know, I don't know when this happens or how it happens. Okay. It just, 
just seem and, and I'm, I live in terror of not having any more good ideas. Okay. How many different forms of data platform would be too many? Well, I think you know there will certainly be there will certainly be main memory OLTP systems uh, that are mostly going to be row stores, and there will certainly be. Uh, column stores for the data warehouse market. Mm -hmm. uh, my suspicion is the vast majority of scientific databases are array oriented and they're doing you know complex codes on them. Mm -hmm. My suspicion is that relational database systems are not going to work out very well there mm -hmm. and that it will be something else, maybe an array store. Uh, you know the market. You know, I think, who knows? Mm -hmm. So I think you know in complex analytics, you know singular value decomposition, linear regression, all that stuff, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is the operations those kind of folks want to want to uh, do on largely array oriented data. Mm -hmm. So I think the the you know the jury is out as to how that's going to be supported. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of graph-based database systems because it's not clear to me that a graph-based system is any faster than simulating a graph either on, on, on a tabular system or on an array system. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll see whether graph-based systems make it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think XML is yesterday's, you know, big idea and I don't see that I don't see that going anywhere so I don't see doing an XML store mm -hmm. a, as a worthwhile thing to try. What about log data? Uh, I mean, it seems to me most of the log processing works fine on data warehouses but uh, well there's no question that stream you know this stream processing associated with the front front end of the log, either that's going to be specialized stream processing engines like Kafka, or it's going to be main memory database systems like VoltDB, and I think the jury is out as to w whether there's going to be a special category called streaming, streaming databases that's mm -hmm. different from OLTP. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there might be half a dozen, but I don't think there are 20. I don't even think there are 10. Okay. You say that there's no query Esperanto. If so, why have you been working on Polystore and Big Dog? Okay, well, first of all, Polystores to me mean multiple query languages. Okay. And, and Big Dog has multiple query languages because I don't think there is a query language Esperanto. Mm -hmm. And so I think the problem among the various problems with distributed databases. Number one, there isn't a query language Esperanto. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, the schemas are never the same on independently constructed data, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a problem. Number three, the data is always dirty and everybody assumes that it's clean. Mm. So I think, you know, that You've got, you've got to have much more flexible poly stores that have multiple query languages and integrate data cleaning mm -hmm. and can deal with the fact that schemas are never the same. Um, that's a good lead into talking about your project Data Civilizer, which aims to automate the grunt work of finding, preparing, integrating, and cleaning data. Can we really solve this problem and how well? Well, this. This comes from the observation made by lots of people that if you, if you talk to a data scientist who is out in the, in the wild doing mm -hmm. data science, no one claims to spend less than 80% mm -hmm. of their time on mm -hmm. the data munging yep. that, that is in advance of doing any analytics. Mm -hmm. So a data scientist spends at most one day a week doing the job for which he was mm -hmm. hired mm -hmm. and 80% doing grunt work. Mm -hmm. 
And Mark Schreiber, who's the chief data scientist for Merck, mm -hmm. he claims it's 98% and mm -hmm. not 80. So, mm -hmm. so they're just the overwhelming majority of your time mm -hmm. uh, if your data scientist is spent doing Hmong work. So in my opinion, if you worry about data analytics, you're worrying about you know the spare change piece of the problem. Mm -hmm. And that if you want to make a difference, you got to worry about automating the Hmong work. Mm -hmm. And so that's the purpose of Data Civilizer, and we're working on it. And Mark Schreiber's using the system that we have, and he, you know, he likes what he sees, so at least we can make some difference. How, how much we can cut down this 80 to 90 percent remains to be seen. But okay. I, think, I think as a community, data integration, you know, we worked on it like 20 years ago, and then it got kind of a bad name. Mm -hmm. But the but the problems in, in the wild are, are still, still there. there, and if anything, mm -hmm. they're much much worse. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know I'd encourage anybody who wants to make a difference to, to work in that area. We said he um, that your Merck guy likes what he sees. Can you make that more? Can you quantify that? Sure. So, so the first problem, so, so at the top level, Merck has about 4,000 Oracle databases. They don't actually know how many they've got. Mm -hmm. And they've got, you know, that's on top of a data lake, on top of uncountable files, on top of sure. everything imaginable. Mm -hmm. So for a starter, if, you, if you're if you say, I'm interested in finding a data set that can be used to figure out whether Ritalin causes weight gain in mice. So there, your first problem is to identify a data set or data sets that actually might have the data you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So there's a discovery problem. So Merck is running the discovery component to Data Civilizer and you know, it paws over Merck data and allows you to, you know, ask these kind of questions. You know, which is, I'm interested in Ritalin. Tell me some data sets that contain Ritalin. Uh, and so they're using that, and they they like what they see. Uh, past that, uh, data cleaning is a huge problem, and. We're working on that, you know, using Merck, Merck and others as a test case. So I think, yeah, I guess this is back to, if you want to make a difference in, in data integration and data cleaning, you've got to find a real world problem, find, a, find, a, find an enterprise that actually wants your problem solved. Because mm -hmm. I think, for instance, in doing data integration, the overwhelming majority of the products I've seen have table one over here, table two over here, and you draw some lines to hook stuff up. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't help anybody mm -hmm. that I know of. Mm -hmm. And I think, for example, uh, Tamer, you know, the commercialization of the original data Tamer system, uh, GlaxoSmithKline is, is a customer of, of Tamer, mm -hmm. and they've got 100,000 tables, mm -hmm. and they want to do data integration at scale 100,000, mm -hmm. and anything that manually draws lines mm -hmm. is a non-starter. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think as, a whole, as a community, mm -hmm. it absolutely behooves us to use, you know, to do the shoe leather, to go out and talk to some in the wild people and mm -hmm. figure out exactly what their problems are and then solve them as opposed mm -hmm. to something that we make up. Definitely. But data integration has been on that top ten list of problems on those Laguna Beach type reports. Forever. As, always. Yes. So how how have things changed that we can finally make some traction? Okay, so let me let me give you a, a, a quick example. So, so I assume you know what a procurement system is? Sure. 
Okay, so how many procurement systems do you think General Electric has? Maybe 500. Uh, 75, but anyway, okay. it's, it's a bunch. Mm -hmm. So, and so let's suppose you're one of these 75 procurement officers and your contract with Staples comes up for renewal. Mm -hmm. If you can figure out the terms and conditions negotiated by your other 74 counterparts mm -hmm. and then just demand most favored nation status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That saves General Electric something like $500 million a year. Mm -hmm. Sure, but and, that was true 25 years ago, right? Yeah, but the, well, but I think, it, you know, the problem is it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. And the desire of, of corporations to integrate their silos is going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. Okay. E either because they want to save money, mm -hmm. or they want to do customer integration, or they you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's a bunch of things that cut that that uh, companies want to do that mm -hmm. are all all amount to data integration. Mm -hmm. And if if you realize that there's five hundred million dollars on the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, then it, it it leads you to not be very cautious to okay. try try wild and crazy ideas. So the thing about Tamer that I find just blew me away, yeah, is that GE was willing to run what I would call a pre-alpha product, just because they were in so much pain, and generally. Database systems, no one will even run version 1.0. Sure. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and so, if you're in enough pain, mm -hmm. then then you'll try new ideas. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think the I think, in terms of data integration, it's very very simple. You apply machine learning and statistics to make to do stuff automatically because anything done manually like drawing lines is just not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's not going to scale, mm -hmm. which is where the, where the problem is. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think the answer is machine learning is something that data integration people have not applied and it works like a charm. And well, it works, it works well enough mm -hmm. that, that the return on investment, you know, works. So I think I think the answer is enterprises are in more pain mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. machine learning can, can help. You've said many harsh words about AI in the past. Was there a moment when AI finally turned the corner and became useful? I think machine I think machine learning is very useful. And, and I think it's 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 going to have a gigantic impact, and I think uh, whether it's conventional or deep, deep learning, mm -hmm. that that the stuff works. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of general AI, uh, I think I'm much less interested in general AI, but and I think ML, uh, I think you know. Google pioneered that deep learning actually works for image analysis, yeah. and I think it works for uh, natural language processing. I mean, there's a bunch of areas where it really does work, mm -hmm. and I think conventional machine learning, uh, you know, based on naive Bayes models, you know, decision trees, whatever, mm -hmm. works well enough in a large number of fields to be worth doing. And so I think, you know, the standard startup idea, or at least from three or four years ago, was pick some area, mm -hmm. say, choosing, you know, choosing pricing on hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, go with some, and so one startup said, okay, that's what I want to do. And they said, well, I'll try it in the Las Vegas market first. Mm -hmm. And they went and got all the data they could find, you know, on thing anything that might relate to hotel rooms. And they ran an ML model, and 
they found out that they could, you know, that based on arrivals at McLaren Airport, mm -hmm. they all, you know, you should, you should, you should set hotel prices based on arrivals at McLaren Airport, which is, sounds like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, applying this, this kind of technology to whatever your prediction problem is, chances are some version of ML is going to work. Unless, of course, there's no pattern at all. Yeah. But in lots of cases, there's a pattern. It's just fairly complicated and not obvious to mm -hmm. you and I. And ML will probably find it. So I think those guys are going to have a big impact. From your perspective as a database researcher, what's the smartest and dumbest things you've seen a hardware vendor do in the last few years? Well, a million years ago when I, when I actually worked for Informix, mm -hmm. so, you know, Informix was losing the relational database wars to Oracle. Mm -hmm. And a succession of CEOs thought the solution to the problem was to buy some startup. Okay. And... So they bought, they bought Illustra, which was the company mm -hmm. I worked for, and after, after that they bought a company called Redbrick, and after that they bought a company whose name I can't remember, who built Java, Java database systems. And they thought, they thought the salvation was going to be buy somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think that's almost always a dumb idea. Because in all, in all of these cases, the company really didn't have a plan for how to integrate you know, what they were buying, how to train their sales force on how to sell it, how to sell it in conjunction with the stuff they already had. And so the, you know, the, when the rubber meets the road, I think I read somewhere that you know, three quarters of the acquisitions that companies make fail. Mm -hmm. And so I think be a lot more careful about what you decide to acquire because lots of times it doesn't work out very well. And I think that that's, and I think if nothing else, the biggest, the biggest problem when HP bought Vertica, mm -hmm. the biggest problem was they really couldn't integrate the Vertica sales force with the HP sales force because the HP sales force knew how to sell iron mm -hmm. and that was, and iron guys couldn't sell Vertica. It was a totally different skill set. So I think, I think that was, anyway, realizing that, you know, integrating, you know, getting value means integrating the sales force, integrating the products, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, Lots and lots of companies screw that up. Are there advances in hardware in recent years that you think have been really good for the database world? Uh, I think the, so I can go, go down the litany of ideas. Uh, I think GPUs uh, are, going, are going to be, for sure will be interesting for a small subset of database problems. If you want to do a sequential scan, uh, GPUs do great. If, if you want to do singular value decomposition, that's all floating point calculations, and GPUs are blindingly fast at floating point calculations. The big caveat, though, is that your, your data set has to fit in GPU memory, because otherwise you're going to be you know, network bound on loading it and mm -hmm. no one's seen, you know. So anyway, there's a, that will be a niche, niche market. Mm -hmm. uh, I think non-volatile RAM is definitely coming. I'm not a, a big fan of, of how much impact it's going to have because it's not fast enough to replace main memory and it's mm -hmm. not cheap enough to replace mm -hmm. solid state disks or disks. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be an extra extra level in the memory hierarchy 
that uh, folks may or may not choose to you know make use of. So I think, uh, but I think it's not going to be a huge game changer. Uh, I think a huge, huge, huge deal is going to be, let me put it generally, which is networking is getting faster at a greater rate than CPUs and memory are getting beefier. So we all implemented uh, you know, distributed systems you know, such as Vertica with the assumption that you were network bound. And that's not true anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's going to cause a fair amount of rethinking of most distributed systems. And so I think partitioning databases you know, no longer makes a great deal. It either makes no sense anymore or mm -hmm. it makes only limited sense. Uh, similarly, if you're running InfiniBand and running uh, RDMA, then Tim Kraska sort of demonstrated that that may make uh, concurrency control systems different than what we're currently doing, you know, workable, which is going to, you know, impact main memory database systems. So I think the networking advances make, make a big difference. Uh, I think another thing, but I think on top of this, uh, you know, James Hamilton, who is one super smart guy, currently estimates that uh, Amazon can stand up a server node at 25% of your, your or my cost. Okay. And, and so uh, sooner or later, that's going to cause absolutely everybody to use cloud-based cloud systems, whether, whether you're renting whether you're letting Amazon run your run your dedicated hardware or whether you're using shared hardware or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, we're all going to move to the cloud, and that's going to be the end of raised floor, uh, you know, computer rooms at all universities and you know most enterprises. So I I think that's going to be an unbelievable impact. And sort of back to the days of time sharing. I think what what goes around comes around. It does, doesn't it? And I think that's that I think is going to make it difficult to do computer architecture research because I think if there are half a dozen gigantic cloud vendors running ten million nodes, and the rest of us are you know have a have a few nodes here or there. Mm -hmm. It says that you pretty much got to work for one of them to get the data to make, to make a difference. What do you wish database theory people would work on now? <sighs> okay, so here, here's something that I would love somebody to work on. So you, you and I uh, I've read all the textbooks, and when you get to database design, all the textbooks say, build an entity relationship model. Mm -hmm. when, when you're happy with it, push a button, mm -hmm. gets converted to third normal form, uh, code against that third normal form, set of tables with ODBC, JDBC. Universal wisdom. Turns out in the real world, nobody uses that stuff. Nobody. Or if they use it, they use it for the greenfield initial design, mm -hmm. and then they get rid of it, then they stop using mm -hmm. it. So, as near as I can tell, the reason is that from, from initial design, sort of schema one, uh, that's the first of an evolution of schemas. Mm -hmm. Uh, as business conditions change. Mm -hmm. And when you move from schema one to schema two, the goal is never to keep the database as clean as possible. That's what our theory says, you know, redo your ER model, get a new set of tables, push the button. So that will keep the schema endlessly in 
you know, third normal four in a good state. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, and no one uses that because their goal happens to be to minimize application maintenance. Mm -hmm. And so let the database get as dirty mm -hmm. you know, a, as required in order to keep down you know, the amount of application maintenance. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice if the theory guys could come up with some theory of database application co-evolution, because mm -hmm. that's, that's clearly what the real world does. So I think, I think the answer is, uh, yeah, it, it, my answer to the, to the theory guys is find a real world problem that somebody's interested in that your toolkit mm -hmm. can be used to address. Mm -hmm. And please don't, please don't make up artificial problems and then solve them. That's good advice for any researcher. What lessons can the database community learn from MapReduce's success in getting a lot of new people excited about big data? Well, I would view MapReduce as a, as a complete and unmitigated disaster. I say, I mean, it, it's Map. Well, let's let's let me be precise. So MapReduce the Google thing where there's a map and a reduce operation mm -hmm. that was uh, rewritten by Yahoo and called Hadoop. Mm -hmm. So that's a particular user interface with a map operation and a reduce operation. Mm -hmm. That's completely worthless. Mm -hmm. No no one, uh, you know, it, the, the trouble with it is that uh, it doesn't, no, no one's problem is 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 simple enough mm -hmm. that that those two operations, you know, will work. Mm -hmm. So what you really mean, well, is say, if you're Cloudera, you've now got a big problem because you've been peddling Map Reduce, mm -hmm. and there's no market for it. Absolutely mm -hmm. no market. Mm -hmm. And Google has officially abandoned it completely mm -hmm. as of two years ago. Mm -hmm. So so what you do very cleverly is apply some marketing and say, well, Hadoop doesn't mean Hadoop anymore. Mm -hmm. It means a three-level stack with HDFS at the bottom, mm -hmm. MapReduce in the middle, and mm -hmm. SQL at the top. Okay. And then you say, well, uh, so that's what Hadoop means, is it's, it's a stack. So then you move forward a year or two and you say, well, now I have this much better implementation of SQL called Impala. Mm -hmm. Impala drops out MapReduce completely mm -hmm. and does SQL on top of HDFS. Mm -hmm. so, so, which is Cloudera realizing that there's no place, you know, 75% of the quote, Hadoop market, end quote, is SQL. Mm -hmm. And in a SQL implementation, there is no place for a MapReduce interface. Mm -hmm. None of the data warehouse products use, use anything like that. Mm -hmm. And Cloudera Impala looks exactly like the other data warehouse guys products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, in my opinion, the quote, you know, Hadoop market is actually a SQL data warehouse market, mm -hmm. and may the 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 cloud guys, you know, and the Hadoop guys and the traditional database vendors mm -hmm. duke it out for who's got the best implementation. Mm -hmm. um, but didn't it get a lot of potential users excited about their data, what they could maybe do with their data? Yes, it and it's a and, gateway drug. But you still don't approve of it. And so what happened was uh, lots of companies went out, drank the Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. and bought 40 node you know, mm -hmm. Hadoop clusters. Mm -hmm. And then some poor schmuck mm -hmm. had to figure out what in the world are we going to do with these. Because mm -hmm. nobody wants MapReduce. Mm -hmm. And so what you have is 
you know, an HDFS file system running on a 40 node cluster. Mm -hmm. So never to be, uh, you know, denied a good marketing opportunity. Mm -hmm. The Hadoop vendors said, well, data lakes are important. Mm -hmm. Well, data lake is nothing but a junk drawer. Mm -hmm. Throw all of your data into mm -hmm. a common place and that ought to be a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I think people all drank the mm -hmm. MapReduce Kool-Aid and they spent a lot of money, you know, buying clusters and then they're now trying to figure out what the heck to do with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the trouble with data lakes is that if you think that solves your data integration problem, you're sadly mistaken. It's mm -hmm. a very small piece of it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not, I'm not opposed to data lakes at all. Mm -hmm. if, if you realize that that's, that's, a, that's a piece of your toolkit to do data integration. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you think that it's a map reduce system, mm -hmm. You know, you're sadly mistaken. And if you think this is your data warehouse solution, uh, I think the problem is that right now HD, you know, right now this the actual actual truth that Cloudera doesn't broadcast mm -hmm. is that Impala doesn't really run on top of HDFS because mm -hmm. the last thing on the planet you want. If you're if you're a data warehouse system, mm -hmm. is a is a storage engine that does tri you know triple redundancy but without transactions, and that uh, puts your data all over everywhere where you have no idea where it is. Mm -hmm. So, clutter you know Impala doesn't use that. It actually drills through HDFS to read and write the underlying Linux files, mm -hmm. which is exactly what all the warehouse products do. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I think, you know, that, you know, that in effect, the big data market is mostly a data warehouse market at this point and mm -hmm. may the best vendor win. Mm -hmm. I think my hope is that, you know, we talked about ML, ML earlier, that complex analytics you know, are going to replace yeah. business intelligence. Yeah. And so hopefully uh, that will turn this whole discussion into how do you want to support, you know, ML mm -hmm. at scale. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what place do database systems have a big place in that, mm -hmm. in that solution? Mm -hmm. Exactly what that's going to be, I think is a very interesting question. What do you think of the database technology coming out of Google, like Cloud Spanner? Okay, well, let's start way back when. Uh, so the first thing, first thing Google said was MapReduce is the best thing since sliced bread. Yes. And True. they and this was a purpose-built system to support their crawl, their web crawl, mm -hmm. you know, for their search engine. Mm -hmm. So about five years go by and all the rest of us say, well, Google said MapReduce is terrific, so it must be good because Google said so. Mm -hmm. And we all jumped on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. At about the same time that Google uh, you know, was getting rid of MapReduce for, mm -hmm. the, for the application for which it was purpose built, namely their search. So they moved it to Bigtable. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, Google and so MapReduce is, is completely useless. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Google has done a succession of stuff. So there's Bigtable, there's BigQuery, there's Dremel, uh, there's dot dot dot. I think personally, Spanner is a little misguided because uh, for a long time uh, Google was saying well eventual consistency is, is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So all their initial systems were eventual consistency mm -hmm. and they figured out maybe in 2014 that eventual 
what the database folks have been saying forever, which is that eventual consistency actually means creates garbage. Okay. Do you want me to explain why? No. So, so, and so essentially everybody has gotten rid of eventual consistency because it doesn't, it, it, it is no consistency guarantee at all. Mm -hmm. So, so I think this was another bad, bad I miss, piece of misdirection from, from Google mm -hmm. that just was mm -hmm. a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And these were bad ideas because Google didn't have any database expertise in house. Mm -hmm. They put random people, mm -hmm. you know, on building stuff and they built whatever they wanted to without really learning the lessons that the database folks had learned over many, many years. So I, I think, uh, so, so Google takes the point of view in, you know, in Spanner with, well, we're going to do, we're going to do, uh, we're not going to do eventual consistency. We're going to do, you know, transactional consistency and we're going to do it over wide area networks. So that was the Spanner idea. And I think if you control the end-to-end -end network, meaning you, you, you own the routers, you own the wires, you own everything in between over here and over there, then I think Spanner very, very cleverly figured out that you could knock down the latency to where a distributed commit worked over a wide area network. Problem is you and I don't control the end-to-end -end network. Mm -hmm. And so we have no way to knock the latency down to what Google can do. So mm -hmm. I think the minute you're not running on dedicated end-to-end -end iron, that the spanner ideas, you know, don't knock the latency down enough to where pe real world people are willing to use it. Mm -hmm. So I think sooner or later, I mean, I, I, I will be thrilled when uh, distributed transactions over wide area networks, that the wide area networks that you and I can can buy mm -hmm. when they're, they'll be fast enough that we're willing to run them because I think that will be great. I think, you know, in a sense, Spanner leads the way uh, on totally dedicated iron. What low hanging fruit is there for machine learning in solving database problems? Well, I think the It's a little, it's a little disconcerting to realize that. So we've been building a database for supporting autonomous vehicles, and so the right now, uh, AV folks want to keep track of whether there's a pedestrian in a particular uh, image, whether there's a bicycle in a particular image, and they want to keep track of a half a dozen things. Mm -hmm. But the number of things you might want to keep track of is at least 500. Mm -hmm. You know, stop signs, uh, free parking spaces, emergency vehicles, uh, unsafe lane changes, mm -hmm. sharp, sharp left-hand turns, mm -hmm. dot, 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 dot. Mm -hmm. So assume there's 500 things you might want to index. Uh, and figuring out which ones to actually index. So, for instance, you might want to index cornfields. And in, in Urbana, that's probably a really good idea. Because uh, it might and, get up and walk in front of the car? Well, because, uh, well... I mean, I'd rather see deer indexed. That'd be fine. I mean, I'm just saying, there's a, there's a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but... They're very situational, I mean, and yeah. just cornfields is a good example because there's lots of them in Illinois. There aren't hardly any inside 128 mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. So you've got to figure out what's actually worth indexing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can probably apply ML to watch, watch the queries that people do and watch and then start by indexing everything and then realize that some stuff is just so rare that isn't worth continuing to index. And mm -hmm. applying ML to do that rather than having it be a manual thing probably yeah. makes a lot of sense. 
do you see a broader role in query optimization, which has become a kind of black art? Uh, I think it, it's certainly worth a try. I mean, I think it's perfectly reasonable to run a plan, record how, how well it did, choose a different plan next time, build up a plan database with, you know, with running times, and mm -hmm. see if you can run ML on that to mm -hmm. do better. I, mean, I think it's an interesting thing to try. If we can't force people to make their data conform to what it really should be, like a unified schema, and if doing the opposite and letting a thousand data flowers bloom results in a terrifyingly complex spaghetti system, what is the happy medium? Well, I think that's basically what we talked about a few okay. minutes ago, which is I think some theory of co-evolution of applications and databases, because I think Right now, the strategy is minimize application maintenance mm -hmm. and let the database design go to hell. Mm -hmm. And the net, net long-term effect of that is, is you get to where you've got to throw everything away and, and redo it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, on the other hand, purity of the database design is something no one's willing to pay for because the application maintenance is too high. So yeah. figuring out what what the happy medium is is, is a, I think a really interesting problem. You've been stunningly successful in pulling together a bunch of universities to work on an integrated project. Was this your solution to the lone gunslinger mentality that you found when you moved to MIT? I had no choice. I mean I, I was I was alone I mean, there were no, no faculty, no students, no courses, no nothing. Uh -huh. And so the, uh -huh. the, only, the only strategy was to reach out to the other universities in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I think what, what ends up happening is that it doesn't work very well at, at Urbana because there aren't enough you know, close by universities. But mm -hmm. in major metropolitan areas, I mean, especially in Boston, uh, the situation was that there's, you know, six or eight universities, each with one or two database people, mm -hmm. and in aggregate, you can you can be a very very strong distributed group. Okay, so in making it work, it's very successful to make it work, and you made it work. So one thing you did was physical proximity still played a role. Oh yeah. How often did you get together? How'd you make the whole thing work? I drove to Brown once a week. I mean, I think. The answer was, mm -hmm. the answer was you, we effectively held group, real group meetings one, once a week mm -hmm. that, and people drove. Okay. And right. that only works if, you're, if you have geographic proximity. Okay. Okay. Other key ingredients? I think I had the great advantage that people were willing to listen to me and pretty much do what I suggested. I think the general problem is that there's a cacophony of ideas mm -hmm. with no way to converge. Mm -hmm. And I think there's got to be mm -hmm. some way to converge. Mm -hmm. And either that takes a lead, a lead gunslinger mm -hmm. or it takes, you know, a program monitor from DARPA, DARPA who's willing to knock heads. There's got to be some way to, mm -hmm. to converge people. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I guess, you know, I, managed to, I may have managed to do that mm -hmm. pretty much. Mm -hmm. Any other ingredients worth mentioning? So we've got those two. Uh, I think the I mean, I think I also have the big advantage that I don't need any more publications. Yes. And so I'm happy to write papers that other people are the first author on. Uh -huh. And I think, so I think the answer is you have to be, it helps to be willing to, to have no, no, no skin in the publication game. And that, that, cause that, that generates a lot of goodwill to make sure that, that you're the last author and not the first author.
One of the great values of Postgres is that it allowed people to experiment with database components, join algorithms, index, index structures, optimization techniques, without having to build the rest of the system. What would be an equally valuable open software system for today? A distributed version of Postgres. So who's going to do that? I know. I mean, it, I mean there is no open source multi-node system I'm aware of that, that's, that, that's, that's really good. And I think how that gets built I think we may, how that gets built remains to be seen. But it's, it's a tremendous amount of work. It's, it's the big problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it, it could come from Impala over time. I mean, it could come from one of the commercial vendors. But the trouble, you know, the trouble with the commercial vendors is that if you want to make money, the standard wisdom is to have a teaser piece that's open source mm -hmm. and then the rest of the system is proprietary. Mm -hmm. And so it's exactly the distributed layer that tends to be proprietary. Mm. So I think the trouble with have, getting it from a vendor is that they all want freemium, freemium models and that makes a bunch of their system proprietary. Uh, I don't think it could come from academia, it's just too hard. I mean, I think the days of building Ingress and Postgres in universities, I think, is gone. I mean, I think the problem is that, I guess the problem is, is that the average PhD student and postdoc have to publish a huge amount of stuff in order to get a job, and they're not willing to you know, code a lot and then write one paper, mm -hmm. which was the way Ingress and Postgres got written, is mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we had grad students that pretty much coded a lot and published a little. Mm -hmm. And that's no longer viable as, as, a, as a strategy. Could you do it with master students? Uh, the problem, well, the problem is MIT, you know, Maybe. I mean, I think the, but I think, you know, let's, let's assume just in round numbers that getting this distribution layer to be fast, reliable, and really work, let's assume it's 10 man years worth of work. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's more, but I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So a master's student is around for a maximum of two years. Mm -hmm. And so you get a maximum of one year of productive work out of that mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And that assumes that they're good. Mm -hmm. Whereas, so the average may be six months. Mm -hmm. So that means you need 20 of these people. Mm -hmm. And that means that occurs over a decade. Mm. I mean, I think it's, because it isn't like a cadre of 20 of them show up and say, here, manage me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, I think it's, I think the scope of the, I mean, in in Ingress and Postgres were both written with one full-time person and, you know, four, three or four or five grad students, no postdocs. And so, you know, that you could actually get something built in a few years with that scope of the team. I just think today it's just much harder to get stuff to work. The big data world has startup fever. We get it. Often it's easier to raise money from the investment community than from traditional sources of academic funding. But how can we maintain the transparency required to move a field forward scientifically if so many ideas are hidden inside the IP of startups, I know it's. I, mean, I think the, you know, it it, it really. It, I find it dis distressing that the success rate for NSF proposals is down to like seven percent. So I mean, it's getting to incredibly hard to raise money from the traditional open source, mm -hmm. uh, open IP mm -hmm. uh, kind kinds of worlds, and so I think. 
I think it's a huge problem. And I think, you know, the way I would look at it is that the number of number of faculty just in any given discipline is up by an order of magnitude over what it was 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. The num- and number of mouths to feed is up by mm-hmm. at least that same amount. Mm-hmm. And funding, you know, is not has mm-hmm. not kept pace at all. So I think mm-hmm. I think we're starving. And I think the the solution the solution is that if you get disgusted with raising money, you just go to Google or, or, or dot, dot, dot. So I think the brain drain out of universities, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it gets to be significant. Why is it a bad idea to bootstrap a startup using your own money? Well, in, so, so the way I view it is that to get the, the app, if you look at Vertica, Illustra, I mean, any of the companies I've started, in round numbers, you know, required 20 or $30 million mm-hmm. to, get, to get a reliable, stable, sellable product out the door. Mm-hmm. So if you're in the, if you're in the consumer, if you're writing an, an iPhone app, that of course isn't true. But mm-hmm. writing, mm-hmm. writing enterprise software, it takes a lot of money, mm-hmm. and getting to something that you can release as version one mm-hmm. is usually five to ten million dollars. Mm-hmm. So unless you're independently wealthy, that's that's not not possible with mm-hmm. self-funding. So the self-funding, uh, you know, companies that I've seen that have succeeded, have all had a sugar daddy, you know, who was a corporation that said, if you write, if, you know, I'll pay for version one mm-hmm. because I need it as an application as, as long as you write something that I want. Mm-hmm. So I think if you have that, then then, then you're basically having customer fund fund the development. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're actually going to fund it out of your own checking account, uh, the trouble is you, you, you and five of your friends agree to write some stuff nights and weekends because you got to have day jobs to keep the bill collectors away. And it just takes forever if you're just writing, writing stuff nights and weekends. The trouble with doing that is that if you if your own money is basically invested, uh, you make very very cautious decisions relative to what the VCs would make. In other words, mm. they're much better businessmen than you are, mm-hmm. and will make much better decisions about money than you will. And then I think you know the stress of. I mean, I I think mortgaging your house to do a startup is something I would never. I mean, that's a, that's a clear way to break up your marriage. <laughs> you recommend that startup founders focus on great engineering, but when I consider the giant corporations in the data world, I get the impression that focusing on great marketing has been a more effective route to build market share. All true. I, mean, I think you, you don't have to look any further than Oracle and Ingress. Uh, so one had great engineering, and one had great marketing, and look who won. Yes. And so I think the the trouble is is that if you want to sell if you want to sell to customer number one mm-hmm. or you know say your your first objective is to build something that's reliable enough that the first five customers will buy it yeah and if you don't and if you don't have really good engineering chances are you're not going to get to that milestone okay. And if you just threw stuff together, chances are it's, it's going to have serious reliability problems, which are, which are going to be very expensive to fix. Mm-hmm. And chances are that's going to impact whether you can get revenue out of your first five customers. So I think you know, worrying, about, worrying about 
superb engineering at the beginning is a really good idea. After that, I think, you know, making sure you have the world's best VP of marketing is, is a terrific strategy. Your research group often implements full DVMSs, and Andy Pavlo has written about the challenges this raises. Do you still feel that this is the best way to advance the state of the art? Well, I think, uh, I think you, you are, this is kind of a big stretch, because if you look at C-Store, you know, C-Store, as has been pointed out by Martin Kirsten, C-Store ran about 10 queries. Mm -hmm. It was not a complete implementation mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we marketed, marketed it as you know, a complete system, but mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, it, it, it really didn't have an optimizer. It hard coded mm -hmm. how to do, you know, the queries and our benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So I think we cut we cut a lot of corners. Uh, I think you know it, and I think in terms of uh, H store. HDOR was more complete, but it didn't have a replication, as I say, the academic system didn't have a replication system. And in point of fact, uh, what Andy Pavlo did was heaved most of the HDOR executor and replaced it by the open source piece of the VoltDB executor. And so HDOR got better mostly because we swipe, you know, open source commercial stuff. So I think, you know, since since Postgres, you know, there really hasn't been what you would call a full function, you know, you know, well functioning system. I think we, we've written pieces of systems. Software is often free now, and not just apps. For example, when was the last time you bought a compiler? Will database software go the same route? Well, I think that's an interesting question because right now, the model used by is by most of the recent DBMS startups is freemium, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that and that isn't really open source. It it, it has a teaser piece that's open source, mm -hmm. but anyone who's going to run it in production is going to get the non-free piece and get and support only comes with the non-free piece. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I think that model works fine. Okay. And but it isn't really it isn't really a complete open source system. I think the I think it will be interesting to see whether you know, whether, whether Amazon, whether, whether the big cloud vendors will actually have complete free open source systems, which probably will only run on their hardware so that they get, they get the rental income from their iron. Mm -hmm. So that might work. But I think right now, I'm hard pressed to, to think of a complete open source system that you'd actually put into production use. You biked across the country and climbed all 48, 4,000 plus foot mountains in New Hampshire. How has athletics affected your professional life? I don't know, I think, I think the, I think the simple answer is that, you know, I, I, I'm wired to Aggressively attempt to achieve what what's hard, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. true in physical stuff. It's true in professional stuff. That's just the way I'm wired. I don't. I, don't, I mean, it's not. There's nothing purposeful there. It's just. You were one of the founders of Cider. Has it been a success or a failure? Well, I think I think the at at the beginning, the reason we started cider was that 
uh, Sigma was turning down practical papers. And I think uh, CIDR has proved to be a great venue for practical stuff over the years. Uh, I think the, you know, the major conferences have attempted with some, I mean, they have industrial tracks, I mean, they've attempted with some success to get more pragmatic stuff. They still, you know, they still turn down my papers that are pragmatic. <laughs> And that still pisses me off. Uh -huh. uh, and I think the, I guess the, the, this, the real cider question is, it, it's caused the major conferences to move some, but in my opinion, not enough. And I think, so I think it continues to be a great outlet for practical papers that the major conferences won't touch. And so I think as long as we stick to our knitting, you know, CIDR will be very viable long term. I mean, it, we have to close, you know, every time it's held, we have to close registration because it's oversubscribed. Are minimum publishable units still a big issue in our community? Oh, I think that that's my favorite pet peeve. Because I think, you know, when when I graduated with a PhD, I had zero publications. When I came up for tenure, you know, five years later, I had like a handful, maybe six, and and that was the norm. I mean, DeWitt was the same way. So I think that was typical back then. Now you have to have an order of magnitude more, you know, in each of these buckets. In, in order to either get an assistant professor job or get tenure. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that forces these publishable units, which I think you know just creates a dizzying sea of junk that we all have to read. And so I think, I think, uh, I think it's awful. And I think it, it causes everybody to think in terms of LPUs. Uh, my favorite strategy, which I don't know might work, is to get the top, say, 20 U.S. universities to just say, if you if you send us an or in computer science, if you send us an application for an assistant professor position, uh, list three publications. We're not going to look at any more. Pick three. Mm -hmm. We don't care if you have more. Mm -hmm. Pick three. Mm -hmm. And when you come up for tenure, pick 10. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you publish more, I don't want to look at them. Mm -hmm. And so if you, got, if you got the top universities to just enforce that discipline, mm -hmm. it, might ha it might knock down the, the publication rates and mm -hmm. start getting people to consolidate more LPUs into, mm -hmm. into bigger and better papers. But I think, I, don't, I mean, it's just, there's just a deluge that I don't, I don't know how anybody keeps up with. And I think, you know, all of us, you know, tell our grad students to go read this or that paper and mm -hmm. tell us what it says. Because I think we just, no, no one can physically read, read all that stuff. You might have the biggest family tree in the database field. Has that been an important factor in your success? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think the. I think success is determined by having good ideas, mm -hmm. and having graduate students, good graduate students, and postdocs to. You know, realize them. And, and I think the. And I think the the fact that I know a lot of people some of whom are my students and some of them are other people's students, I think is not all that significant. When you pick a new problem to work on, how do you balance intellectual satisfaction, your industry buddy's depth of desire for a solution, and the gut feeling that you might be able to turn it into a startup? Uh, I, I don't think in those terms at all. I think, I think mostly in terms of find a problem that somebody has 
and work on it. And if you if you solve it in a way that's commercializable, well, that's downstream. You don't you don't get any pennies in my university for for doing startups. Uh, I think the biggest mistakes I've made have been uh, having prototypes and having a student really want to do a startup mm -hmm. and encouraging me to do a startup when I was very reluctant and usually I was right and, and so I've created startups that have failed uh, and one of the biggest reasons is that I was I didn't think it, it, it worked at the beginning and you know having us having a PhD student pleading with you, you know, mm -hmm. pl please do a startup. It's hard. I find it hard to resist. Were you more productive at Berkeley or at MIT? I think I've been much more productive at MIT. And why is that? I have no idea. I mean, I think. I mean, I think if you, if you just look at the look at the data, I did three startups in twenty five years at Berkeley. Uh -huh. I did six startups in you know sixteen years at, at MIT. So, uh huh. Which do you think had more impact, though? Uh, I I think you know number number one was probably Postgres, and number two was probably Vertica. Okay. It's, it's not obvious one way or the other. What successful research idea do you most wish had been your own? Oh, parallel databases. Okay, sure. If you had the chance to do one thing over again, what would it be and what would you do differently? Uh, I would have worked on parallel databases <laughs> okay. in, the, in the 70s. Recurring theme, I think. Um, tell me about a time when you had a seemingly great idea that didn't turn out so well. Uh, I think I, I was a big fan of distributed databases <laughs> for quite a while, okay. and, and there was no there was okay. there was no market for it, and I I was very slow to let the real world okay. tell it. You know, <laughs> at mm -hmm. the end of the day, the real world is is the you know the ultimate jury and I was mm -hmm. slow to realize that there was no market. Did you ever have an idea that the research community rejected but that you still believe in fervently and may pursue again? Uh, well you as near as I can tell you know the everybody including me uh, if a paper gets rejected, you, you rewrite it mm -hmm. until it gets accepted. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know of any, pap any papers that actually went out of the cutting room floor. You know, we, we, all, we all modify them until they get accepted. If you were a first-year data-oriented graduate student right now, what would you pick to work on? Uh, if you have a good idea on how to do cloud stuff, you know, you know everybody's going to move to the cloud. That's going to be a huge amount of disruption. We're, we're going to run database systems where we share a million nodes. So if you, have a, if you have a good idea on how to make that stuff work, uh, data integration is an unbelievably hard problem unbelievably important. If you have a good idea there, I would work on that. If you have a good idea on database design, I would work on that. Uh, if you have a good idea on data cleaning, mm -hmm. by all means, work on that. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, find some problem in the wild mm -hmm. that you, you can solve and solve it. Are there any hot topics in database research right now that you think are a waste of time? Well, it seems to me that the way I view the database research community is that the stuff that we used to think of as 
database core competency yeah. is now a very minuscule proportion of what appears in SIGMOD and, and mm -hmm. VLDB. Mm -hmm. so, so the field is basically fragmented beyond recognition. Mm -hmm. And so there's very, there's very little papers on core, there's very few papers on core database stuff mm -hmm. that, that are appearing these days. And I think I'm, I'm kind of a little bit worried because if we say, so let's just say we were talking about ML earlier. So, mm -hmm. so the database guys are all, are all publishing ML papers under the guise of scalability. Mm -hmm. And so that isn't our community that, you know, there's an, there is an ML community Mm -hmm. that worries about ML mm -hmm. and we don't publish there mm -mm. we and mostly I suspect because you know we're sec you know we're second rate researchers in you know you know in in pure ML conferences so I think we're doing a lot of non cutting edge research in all these fragmented different fields and yeah, you know, and I wonder what I wonder what the long term impact of that's going to be, and I wonder what the long term definition of as near, I mean, as near as I could tell, Sigma or NBLDB is three hundred or so researchers and everything they and their grad students are doing, mm -hmm. which is a huge spectrum of stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I think deciding what's what's workable and not work not workable becomes very very diffuse that isn't that inevitable in an expanding field like ours yeah but i think but i think you know if you look at the operating system guys they're starting to write database papers and so in, in, in their venues. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, you get, you just get a lot of fragmentation. And at some point, it seems to me that we probably ought to reorganize computer science. The most important thing to me is that, uh, you know, CMU and Georgia Tech you know, have schools of computer science mm -hmm. that seem much better able to, you know, organize around this diff diffuse nature of things. Mm -hmm. uh, MIT doesn't, mm -hmm. and so I think the, the the universities that don't have schools of computer science will be disadvantaged long run, long term. And that's like that, and that's a political hot potato at MIT and elsewhere. Which of your technical projects has given you the most personal satisfaction? Uh, I think Ver Vertica and Postgres. You know, but I, think in a, I think Vertica because Postgres we rewrote and then we rewrote it again. And, mm -hmm. and as, as, you, as somebody pointed out, we started off implementing Postgres and Lisp. Mm -hmm. which was the biggest disaster on the planet. And mm -hmm. that's probably my biggest technical mistake ever. <laughs> and so Postgres eventually got it more or less right. Uh -huh. Vertica got it pretty much right the first time, which I thought was remarkable because mostly you rewrite everything when you realize you screwed it up. Mm -hmm. And then you rewrite it again when you realize you still screwed it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think Ver Vertica did pretty well the first time, which I thought was pretty remarkable. What was the most difficult part of your cross-country bike trip in your career? Well, my the Turing Award lecture said North Dakota, and North Dakota was awful, just absolutely awful. Uh, not not so much because it, it's flat and boring uh, and you know you, you spend your day 
looking up ahead 10 miles, seeing the grain elevator in the next town, riding toward it for three quarters of an hour, and then passing through it in a couple of minutes, and then 10 miles up ahead is the next grain elevator. And that's, mm -hmm. really, that's really monotonous and boring. Mm -hmm. But what made, it, what made it impossibly hard was we were fighting impossible headwinds all the way across North Dakota. And that is, that is, it is so demoralizing when you're struggling to make seven miles an hour and you realize that it's a 500 mile wide state. Yeah. So that was pretty demoralizing. And I think that what was the hardest point in my career? Yeah, the North Dakota of your career. Uh, I think it was by no means, it was by no means a slam dunk that I was going to get tenure at Berkeley. I think that was, that was, I think the department probably went out on a limb to make that happen. Because at, at the time, you know, databases were kind of, this little backwater, and so so, somebody had enough vision to to promote me. So, but I think you know the stress associated with getting tenure, I think, is awful for everybody. Universally, and the year that you're up for tenure is is horrible, no matter who you are. And, and I personally think, I personally think we. You know, we shouldn't subject assistant professors to that kind of stress. I mean, I think, because the whole thing is, we should invent a better tenure system or a gradual tenure system or a something, something else. Because I think the stress, the stress level we subject assistant professors to is awful. If you were retired now, what would you be doing? Uh, well, I think that's, that's equivalent to the question, what do I do when I'm no longer competitive as a researcher? So and, that's the definition of retired, is when you're no longer competitive as a researcher. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to work, I'm going to do what I'm doing until I'm not okay. competitive doing it. And because I, you know, I wake up in the morning and I like what I do. Uh, the only aspect of my job that I hate is is editing s student papers, especially, I say, st students by and large can't write worth a darn. And you know, I'm you know, I'm as everybody else is, so am I, stuck fixing their papers. So I hate doing that. You hate that. I. That's one of the parts of the job I actually like more. Great. <laughs> You're really fortunate. Uh, so what would I do? Uh, no, I think you answered it pretty much. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the real question which you youngsters don't really have to face, or you probably don't think about it, is what's the state of my physical health at this point in time? Because mm -hmm. if I'm impaired, then Life's in a whole different ballpark. Mm -hmm. If I'm full function, I will hike a lot more. I will bike a lot more. Mm -hmm. I always threaten to do woodworking. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave DeWitt laughs at me because I have a woodworking shop that is essentially unused. Mm -hmm. I would spend more time with my wife. I would spend more time up here. Uh, the real, the real answer is that I would probably become, become a venture capitalist of sort. Ah. That I would, I would help, if I'm, not, if I'm not viable with my own ideas, then I, I mean, I'm very good at helping people start companies. So I, I would probably do, do a whole bunch of that. I'm told that I should ask you to sing the Yellow Rose of Texas. Oh, only after many, many beers or glasses of wine. Okay. And I think that actually wasn't... I don't know where that came from because the only, the only place that could have come from was 
the the Illustra guys invited me to one of their sales reward meetings, and so everybody had to get up and do and do karaoke. And I don't think I did the Yellow Rose of Texas. Maybe I did, but that's the only time I can remember. I, I say, I, I wonder where did that question come from? I would never give away my sources, even if I remembered who contributed that one, which I actually don't. But anyway, I, I'm the world's worst, worst singer. Okay. So I sing in a great monotone. I hear you play the banjo for a bluegrass, bluegrass band called the Shared Nothings. Uh, How'd you get interested in the banjo and bluegrass music? Uh, well, when, when my first wife and I separated in 1975, I went out and bought a banjo you know, within a couple months and then asked the guy who sold the banjo, what kind of music do you play with this stuff? Uh. And I have no idea why. I mean, there's nowhere in my history that anybody ever had a banjo. So I don't have any idea why I decided to take it up. And uh, having kids got in the way of having time to play, but after the kids were adults, then I started playing again. And so I'm now in a, a band of sorts called Shared Nothing Singular. Mm -hmm. And Shared Nothing Singular is, is exactly the technical distributed, distributed database uh, use of Shared Nothing. And so, yeah, we jam, we, we jam we jam every couple of weeks, and, and but calling it a band is, you know, we we our our goal was to start playing at you know in, in at uh, you know at uh, assisted living centers because they're always looking for something for people to do. Have you reached that level yet? So we we asked. So I know I know a friend who who whose father is in. Facility, and, mm -hmm. and so he pointed me to their, you know, entertainment director. Mm -hmm. So they said, I said, "Can we come play for your, for your folks?" And she mm -hmm. said, "Well, send us a tape." <laughs> so we made a tape, and that was the last we heard from her. So, so we're not at, yet at the level of okay. playing at assisted living centers. Okay, it's something to aspire to. So, so we're. We're good enough to play in front of my PhD students, okay. who are captive okay. captive audience. I hear that you wear a lot of red shirts. Yep. Why? And how many do you own? Uh, approximately fifteen, and I have no idea why. <laughs> you know, I have a red boat, and, and and I like you know I like red. I would. For a long time, I drove a red car, and anyway, I, red is my favorite color for whatever reason. I have no idea, and so I, I wear red shirt, red shirts, although not today. Not today. To avoid the draft for the Vietnam War, you had to go straight to grad school after college. You said that this forced you into a career path prematurely, without time to explore the other options. In hindsight, what path do you think you would have taken if there hadn't been a draft? Well, the, first of all, when, when I graduated from college in 1965, my exact choices were go to graduate school, go to Vietnam, go to jail, or go to Canada. Okay. I mean, those were the exact choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and at the same time, if I went to graduate school, that was that was right at the time of the post -Sput Sputnik, mm -hmm. you know, science craze. So, so I had a full ride, full rights fellowship to sit out the war in graduate school. So, why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, and so you had to sit in graduate school till you were 26, and the government didn't want you anymore, mm -hmm. and so. That that forced me to get a PhD that I I don't think I ever would have gotten without that kind of pressure. So you're probably not old enough to remember 
a TV show called Route 66. Have you ever heard of that? I yeah. haven't watched it though. Oh, you have. So it's these two guys who drive around the country in a Corvette mm -hmm. and have great experiences. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I would have done the Route 66 thing. And I have no idea where that would have led. And the uh, and, I, and I think, you know, for me, sitting it out in, you know, the threat of the draft, you know, is, is a powerful motivator to get a PhD, which I don't think I ever would have gotten, you know, otherwise. So I have no idea what, what would have happened, but it would have certainly been very different. Do young computer scientists even need a computer science degree today? Uh, in my opinion, yes, because just because when when I when I look around, the uh, I mean we we talked about Google earlier that Google had a bunch of projects, database projects that they put other people that they put people mm -hmm. skilled at other stuff on, yeah, and they screwed them up, mm -hmm. or these you know they they implemented short term systems that weren't viable long term, long -term. Mm -hmm. and so I think you know th there's a lot of there's a lot of theory and pragma that we've learned over the years mm -hmm. that that you should know and somehow somehow figuring that stuff out I think is important and I don't know I don't know what better way to do it than, than by studying computer science and I think, by and large, if you look at people in surrounding disciplines who, who actually end up doing computer science, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like most of the physical science, sciences, you say, what, what contribution have they really made to computer science? Mm -hmm. The answer is it's not very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, for, for whatever reason, computer science advances tend to come from people who are trained as computer scientists. Do you have a philosophy for advising graduate students? The simple answer is that you're, you're, every faculty member, you know, your, your charge is to make them successful. And when you take someone on, it's basically an agreement to make them successful. And if they drop out, then you're a failure. And so, so I try very, very hard to make them successful. And usually that means feeding them good ideas when they don't have any of their own. Uh, and pushing them hard, you know, saying, you know, the VLDB deadline is in three weeks. You can, in fact, get a paper in. You'll have, you know, you'll have to... Progress will have to be exponential in the distance to the deadline, but you can do it. So, so be a cheerleader and push your students to, you know, to to uh, push push your students to get stuff done at a rate much faster than they think they can. Mm -hmm. And when they go off the rails, as they always do, you know, pull them back onto the rails. By, by, and this just takes a lot of time. So I meet with meet with all my students once a week or more. And my my job is cheer cheerleader, idea generator, and encourager. If you magically had enough extra time to do one additional thing at work that you're not doing now, what would it be? Uh, the tr trouble is, I think, if I have a good idea, I start working on it, even if I don't have any extra time. You, mm -hmm. you, f you mm -hmm. fit it in. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I'm a, I, don't, I don't have a good idea just sitting, you know, waiting to, for, for some time to work on. So I don't know what I do. I, uh, I think... Getting up in the morning and having nothing that I have to do, you know, drives me crazy. 
so, so you know, I stay, I stay, I stay very busy, and I don't know what I would do with with free time. If you could change one thing about yourself as a computer science researcher, what would it be? Uh, I'd learn how to code. Uh, you know, you had a That's question. what you said last time. But, you know, obviously, being able, uh, since you've achieved high success without being able to code, it must not be necessary. I know, it's just embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, but I say, it, it's something that just take, takes a lot of time that I don't have. Okay. So if I could magically create a lot of time, I would learn how to code. Maybe while you were going across North Dakota in the headwinds, you could have been practicing on a little keyboard on the handlebars. That would have made it less painful. <laughs> I don't think you've ever been to North Dakota. I have, I have, but it, it, from your description, it looks a lot like Illinois. Yeah. The secret is to, to ride with the wind behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you just could have gone to the far end of the state and ridden that way, and you still would have crossed North Dakota. I see. It's just the wind would have been helping you. There you go, yeah. Thank you very much for talking with me today.